Could you tell me, how do you define MGUS? Or, and what's the significance of MGUS? So in, in a nutshell, there was discussion back in the 60s uh, whether these proteins that we have been talking about, the abnormal monoclonal proteins, if they were related to multiple myeloma or if they were benign. And there were two schools of thought. So one school of thought said that these are benign proteins. It's actually John Waldenstrom who discovered Waldenstrom's uh, microglobal anemia. He said this is benign monoclonal protein. And there was another school of thought who said that this is pre-myeloma. So in the late 1970s, Bob Kyle from the Mayo Clinic said, let's say it's unknown. So he declared monoclonal gammopathy of undetermined significance. So just two schools of thought could kind of, could agree to that. But over time, uh, it has been found that about 1% of patients progress into myeloma per year. Um, so, so these are the statistics. So that's where the acronym comes from. But we, we know much more today uh, there have been a lot of recent genomic uh, discoveries and there is ongoing uh, studies as we speak indicating that there probably are some people who are quite unfortunately predisposed for progression yeah. while others probably have an extremely low likelihood. So my thinking is that probably it is maybe monoclonal gammopathy or it is a high predisposition for myeloma. So these are not yet kind of agreed upon yeah. conventions, but I think that's where the field is going. There is a, a, a rare form of genetic multiple myeloma, I believe, too. I, I don't understand the genetics of it, but I think there is a, f a genetic form that is known to exist, a familial form, at least. So we did studies years ago. Uh, I used to work in Washington, D.C. at the NIH for 10 years before I came to New York. Uh, and we did familial aggregation studies where we looked in, in large uh, data sets. We actually looked in Scandinavia and, and places like that. And taking advantage of huge uh, population-based uh, multi-generation data sets, we were able to show that the familial uh, increase could be as high as twofold. And that sounds quite high if you just hear the, the number two there. Uh, but you have to be very careful when you, when you think about these things because the actual risk for myeloma, let's say in the population, is maybe six per 100,000. Yeah. So if you double that, we are talking 10 to 12 cases per 100,000. So the absolute risk in the family is still very low. Uh, there is also an increased risk for monoclonal gammopathy in family members with myeloma. But I think clinically very important there is no increased risk for transformation from the monoclonal gammopathy to myeloma if you have a family member, uh, for example, with myeloma or with monoclonal gammopathy. That so that's important. I believe that if 1% of people with MGUS progress per year to myeloma, that's one thing. But is it not true that 100% of myeloma patients had MGUS at one time? That is true. And uh, we actually did that study together with the... Uh, Bob Kyle, uh, in 2009, we published in the Blood Journal a large study yeah. uh, based on something called the NCI PLCO cancer screening trial. Right. Yeah. So almost 100,000 people uh, participated in a trial. They have a cancer-free, and they had to be 55 to 74 years of age. Men and women followed over time, and they gave blood once a year for very many years. So in that study, we identified an, uh, any individual who had been diagnosed with myeloma up to 10, 10 years from study start. And then we got permission to go back and take all the blood samples. And we looked to see if there were abnormal proteins. And we showed that every person had this monoclonal gammopathy. That's before. correct. You found 71 cases, I believe. I that was the original study. Yeah.